to still linger outside, we would probably have to resume the session in just a few minutes. Please be invited to be seated once again so that we could proceed the program for further presentation. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, may we proceed the presentation. Professor, thank you very much for the break and please continue. Little voice, big voice. Okay. Now, let's start out and let's apply technique, relatively simple. In psychology, it's an extension of a test called the Rorschach test. Uh, I created an exercise called word association. Uh, what I'd like you to do, you can either write this down on paper or you can keep it in your mind. I'd like you to answer this question in three time periods. Time two today. Time period number three, five to ten years from now. And the question that I have for you is this. First, I'd like you to describe, just take a few words, no sentence, no paragraph, just take a few words which best describe Thai education five to ten years ago. Three, four words, very simple. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Put it on paper. That best describes Thai education five to 10 years ago. Next, I'd like you to look at Thai education today. And I'd like you to identify three or four words when you think of Thai education right now, what are the words that first come to your mind? Write them down. Okay, finally, I'd like you to look to the future. Five to 10 years from now, 2017, 2022, what three or four words should describe Thai education where it should be five to ten years from now. Okay. So you're looking at where you've been, where you are, and where you are going. Now, if the same word is in the past, the present, in the future, and if it's a word that doesn't complement what you want to achieve, you got a problem. Okay, so let's look at progression, where you are and what to change. Again, I preface this, I am not an authority on Thai education, but what I'd like to do is look at little glimpses, little pieces that if you put together and look at the experience of others, Maybe there's a few points of learning here for us. This was developed by a men, gentleman by the name of Jim Collins. Collins wrote several books. Uh, one was called Good to Great. A recent book about a year ago, How the Mighty Fall. And his most recent book came out about six or eight weeks ago and it's called Beyond Good to Great. Now, this is called the flywheel. And as you see, it's got the yin and yang that you find in a Korean fan. Now, what's the principle here? The principle is there are two parts to it. There are the parts that we should keep and maintain. We should nourish and let grow. There are the parts we should be open to change. So according to Collins, he said you should preserve the core values, the core purpose. Translate that to me. In Thai education, what are you all about? Are you about obedience? Or are you about growth and nation building? So you have to clearly define what is your center, your core. In exercise physiology, they have something called a core training program. And it says, focus on those core muscles which hold everything else together. Define your core because that should drive everything else. 
Now, what can I change? If we look at the miles model before we took a break, we can change infrastructure, rules, regulations, policies, practices. We can change the shape of the classroom. We can change how many teachers should be in the classroom. When I was getting teacher education, because education was one of my majors in my first degree, my bachelor's degree, I started to be trained in team teaching. That was one of the latest techniques that was coming out. So here, this is the mechanism to put things into practice. But this is your focus that you want to build on and to leverage. So the flywheel idea is an excellent idea if you're a company, if you're a university, a school, a ministry, or a government. Because it says, as long as this is strong and this is flexible, you can continue to be relevant and prosper. Now, cultural legacies. This is out of the work of Malcolm Gladwell. He came out with a book called The Outliers a few years ago. And Gladwell talked about cultural legacies. This is from a presentation I did in Saudi Arabia about six months ago. Cultural legacies are powerful and pervasive. They persist long after the original usefulness has passed. OK, cultural legacy. Let's apply it to Thailand. What are we talking about? You can see her uh, eyebrows are kind of furrowed like, ah, this guy's crazy up here on the stage. What we're talking about is this. We know that traditionally, culturally, Thailand is a very polite culture. We also know that seniority is highly respected. We know in Thailand, in Malaysia, uh, looking into the eyes of a teacher, Ajahn, is a sign of disrespect. You look down rather than up. You listen rather than question or challenge. Problem is, if I don't understand, but if the culture tells me, don't question because it's a sign of disrespect, how can I learn? And if the teacher is in front, and the teacher is not getting any questions, he or she is thinking, oh, they understood. Let's move on. And half the group is left outside mentally because they didn't understand the first thing that was said. There was a lecture at the University of Abaddon in Nigeria some years ago. And the lecture invited a gentleman who is a professor at the Administrative Staff College of Nigeria. He's a specialist in the area of local government. So. He entered the room, and of course, in proper Nigerian and West African style, culturally, first he sent in his driver with two suitcases. So the driver comes up on the stage, suitcase is loaded. And then the driver quickly opens up the suitcases from which he takes books and covers the table in books. Then the professor comes in, and of course, Professor takes four books out of the pile and he puts them up like this, standing up so people could see. What were they? Books that he had written. Then he promptly stood behind the table and for the next 90 minutes gave a lecture, virtually without taking a breath, talked incessantly. There was a gentleman from the Royal Institute of Public Administration in London running this training session. His name was Ken Thompson. He was the director. So Ken called the break at 90 minutes. And as people are walking out of the room, Ken asked each Nigerian participant, well, what did you think of the lecture? How did he do? And one of the Nigerian participants said this, he is absolutely brilliant. I didn't understand a word he said. If you are brilliant, I fail. If you can do something, I win. So what we have to do here is go beyond. If it says, if I evaluate you and I can't tell you where you need to improve, what happens in a company when you do performance appraisal? 
he thinks he's doing well. So he continues to repeat the behavior. Today, it's a small thing. 10 years from now, this is the core for him to be effective or not as a leader. Because I didn't tell him 10 years ago, you're not good at this, and here's how, what you gotta do to improve. He thinks, okay, law. Now he stands for promotion. His record is clean, nothing says against him, he gets promoted. And he's an absolute disaster. But we were polite. We saved face. Nobody felt uncomfortable until he got the job. Now everybody is uncomfortable. How is that nation rather than helps? All culture has two elements, enabling aspects. There are things that get behind, they push you to succeed. But all cultures also have something called a disabling element. They hold you back from achieving. What we have to do is look at not just national culture, but corporate culture. The culture of our schools and ask, are there things that we require, that we support, that hold the achievement back? And if so, how can we change it to get it out of the way? Then we have something called the cycle of avoidance. This comes from work in the area of cross-cultural conflict management. Uh, if you avoid, like our example before, you save face, people short term, feel okay. Avoidance in conflict management is accepted as a coping device. We call it that because it buys time. It doesn't solve anything, but it buys time. Now, if I ignore it here, that means what should have changed didn't. Now we have ignore it again. It's kind of like the big elephant in the room. Nobody says is there. By the time this continues, it gets bigger and bigger. Ultimately, it can paralyze us. Again, this is a short-term strategy occasionally could work as a continuous element. It's a recipe for failure rather than success. Parkinson. Some years ago, Parkinson wrote a book called Ultimately Parkinson's Law. And what Parkinson said was, you have to be suspicious when a society, an organization, a country, when they start building beautiful buildings. The tallest building in the world is Burj Al Arab, Dubai. It's about two-thirds of a mile tall. Azerbaijan, a few years from now, will have a taller one. Now, a mistake made by many of my American and Western colleagues, they come in as consultants trying to sell you something. I'm a development consultant. My job is kind of bubble up from the floor, first trying to understand where you are, based upon that work with you to see what options you have. But many consultants come in and they talk, hoot mock mock, rather than listen. Well, what we find in Parkinson's Law, Many people will go into the Arab world and see the brand new buildings and they make the mistake that these countries are modern. And modern they're defining as quality. They're forward thinking. And that is an absolute mistake. Those countries that have world class buildings are not modern. The mentality is still traditional. We have to be careful about the difference between erecting buildings to show standard. My question is, what happens inside? I don't care if you have a new building or an old. Frankly, I have taught in, in huts, in villages scattered throughout Sierra Leone, Liberia, Swaziland, Kenya. Hasn't bothered me. I've been in the open air under the tree in Arusha up Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. The key question is, is learning happening? Not what's the quality of the building. The nation, Bangkok Post as well, have said just this past week or two, 
To raise the quality of education, you need to focus upon what happens in the classroom. Clear statement to me. Later, you'll see a quote. If you look at the results of the GATT and the PAP test, which were just released in Thailand, they have a little statement, which is a critical statement. It said, and I quote, those that scored the lowest did not go to private tutorial sessions, which meant they only learned in the school. That's it. They didn't have the advantage, economically or opportunity, to go to special prep schools to learn. Those are the ones who scored well. My question is, if the fate of your nation is dependent upon the quality of tutoring, what happens in your classrooms? Something's wrong. 